Eh, para la traducción simultánea, en este momento vamos a hacer el, eh, la bienvenida. Para la traducción simultánea, en este momento vamos a hacer la bienvenida. Vamos a hacer el otro en inglés y luego yo mismo la haré en español. Luego le pido otro por favor. ¿Escucha la traducción? ¿Escucha la traducción? Good afternoon and welcome to this press conference, which marks the end of the two week visit of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Stream Policy and Human Rights to everyone. A very warm welcome to everyone attending here Quito, and also those who are joining via Zoom. Oliver de Schutter and his team have been in Ecuador since 28 August and have visited Quito, Valle del Chota, Cuyo, and Chimborazo. Assessing the situation of peoples and communities living in, uh, living in poverty, as well as the steps being taken to address it. Mr. De Schutter will today present us with his preliminary findings on the state of poverty in Ecuador and recommendations on what can be done to eradicate it. Copies of Mr. De Schutter's end of mission statement will be circulated and also be available online in English and Spanish on the website of the High Commissioner, High Commissioner of Human Rights. Following Mr. Deschardes' presentation, I will be opening the door, opening the floor for questions here in the room and also via Zoom, where you can already ask your questions in the chat box. Buenas tardes y bienvenidas, bienvenidos a esta rueda de prensa que marca el final de la visita de dos semanas de el relator especial de las Naciones Unidas para la extrema pobreza y los derechos humanos a Ecuador. Un saludo especial a quienes están acá presencialmente en Quito y a quienes se juntan a esta transmisión y a Zoom. El equipo del de señor Oliver de Schoeder, y él en persona, ha visitado el Ecuador desde el 28 de agosto y ha estado en Quito, Puyo, en la provincia de Chimborazo y en el sector del Valle de Toto. Mirando la situación de personas y comunidades viviendo en situación de pobreza y además de las medidas que se toman para atenderlos. El señor de Schaller presentará hoy su. Va a presentar hoy sus primeras impresiones de la situación de pobreza en Ecuador y las recomendaciones que se pueden tomar para poder erradicar. Copia de, esta, de este informe de final de misión van a ser circulados acá y también van a estar disponibles en línea en el sitio del alto comisionado de derechos humanos, tanto en español como en inglés. Al final de la presentación estaremos abriendo un espacio para preguntas que pueden ser tomadas tanto de las personas que gentilmente nos acompañan en esta sala, como de quienes están a través de la sala Zoom, a quienes les pedimos que consignen sus inquietudes en el área de chat. Mr. Tesoro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for these uh, introductory remarks, and I look forward to addressing the the questions that will be um, asked after my presentation. Let me start by expressing my deep gratitude to the government of Ecuador for having facilitated this visit. Uh, Ecuador has been showing its willingness to cooperate with the human rights system by inviting me to the country and speak to a large number of communities, individuals, NGOs, living in poverty, and of course, um, I was privileged to meet with uh, a very large number of high-level public servants in the country, including President Guillermo Lasso, members of the, the cabinet, um, including um, Mr. Esteban Bernal, the Minister for Economic and Social Inclusion, and mm -hmm. uh, the Secretary on Child Malnutrition, Erwin Ronquillo, the Minister of Education, Maria Brown, um, Alvaro Garcet, the Vice Minister on Human Mobility, um, as well as Rodrigo Barrela and Jimena Diaz uh, from the Office of the Defensor del Pueblo. 
I am extremely um, um, grateful to Ecuador for this invitation. We have to recall that um, countries are not obliged to accept, to cooperate um, with the special procedures of the United Nations of the United Nations. They do so on a voluntary basis. Uh, but it shows the openness of Ecuador to exchanging with the United Nations and frankly addressing the challenges the country has to face. Over the past couple of years, most international reports concerning Ecuador were focusing on one single issue, rising insecurity, the rise even of political violence manifested, um, for example, by the assassination of Fernando Villavicencio uh, just a month ago, um, 11 days before the elections of August 20. I think it's a very unfair treatment of the country, and I think it should not obfuscate the need to address the rising sense of insecurity, not only by a response based on law and order, the man of uh, but also a response grounded in human rights, uh, focusing on the fight against poverty. I believe that today there is emerging a vicious cycle between uh, poverty and insecurity. Uh, young adults who have uh, had children lost out of school become easy recruits for the gangs, uh, the cigarettes. Uh, they are also increasingly uh, candidates to immigrate to the United States. They may be tempted by uh, smuggling uh, goods across borders. In other terms, poverty, the lack of economic opportunity, is one of the root causes of the violence that we see in the country. And in turn, insecurity violence causes poverty. Small businesses have to pay the vacuna to be uh, protected. Schools are unsafe, and some parents decide not to send their children to school because of fears for their security. And of course, revenues from tourism uh, may uh, be impacted by the sense of insecurity. So I believe that a response is, is needed um, based on um, the, the human rights standards that Ecuador has um, agreed to abide by, uh, by investing more in uh, education, health, and in people. Let me start my uh, preliminary observations from my two weeks in the country by highlighting five major achievements of Ecuador, uh, four of which uh, can be credited to the outgoing administration of President Lasso, that I think um, are sources of hope. The first major achievement um, is that child malnutrition in the country has remarkably decreased over the past couple of years. Um, it has fallen by 3.5 percentage points to around 20% of um, the children in the country. Um, and that is uh, very much to the credit of the work of um, Erin um, Ronquillo, whom I mentioned already. And that is, of course, extremely important. Children who are malnourished pay a very high price, uh, a life sentence for you for a crime they have not committed. This is a major achievement, and although we still have in the country some 2.4 million people who live in food insecurity, uh, I think this progress achieved on this front deserves uh, to be uh, saluted. The second major achievement uh, of the country uh, in recent years is that the level of the minimum wage has been increased. Um, and in fact, there is a commitment to increase the minimum wage by $25 per month uh, each year. Uh, it is currently at $450. This is still uh, below the Batista Canesta, the, the cost of living estimated at $779 uh, per month. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a very promising sign uh, that the government has given by agreeing to increase the minimum wage to make uh, work uh, more uh, rewarding for, for workers and ensure that we do not have working poor in the country. The third 
major progress is the extension of the coverage of social assistance. In 2020, $500 million were going to the different uh, uh, social assistance schemes, the bonos, including the most important, the scheme, the bono, the desarrollo humano. Today, in 2022, um, $1.2 billion went uh, to these schemes. And that is a significant increase, um, which is the result of much improved coverage. In 2020, only about 30% of uh, the 30% the, the poorest households, uh, the three lowest deciles, were covered by social assistance. Today, that percentage is 80%, which is a significant growth. Although one should acknowledge at the same time that reaching the lowest decile, the 10% poorest, remain very much a challenge uh, in the country. That is, I believe, the third important achievement. It is the, the growing um, uh, dedication to social assistance schemes and the increased budget that are dedicated. The fourth uh, achievement is that Ecuador has shown extraordinary generosity in welcoming refugees, migrants, particularly from Venezuela, about 500,000 Venezuelan refugees have entered the country in recent years. Um, two successive waves of regularization were organized, allowing them to have access to formal employment and to have access to social assistance. And these migrants have been treated with great generosity in Ecuador, having access to education, to healthcare in particular. And I would like to uh, congratulate Ecuador for its efforts. I think all the international community is extremely grateful for the generosity that it has extended to these migrants. Fifth and finally, one should acknowledge that in contrast to many other countries, Ecuador has organized its social protection system so as to include in that protection also groups of population that are generally excluded. Informal workers, for example, have access to a social protection scheme called the Seguro Voluntario. They contribute a minimum amount uh, to this uh, scheme um, and they are uh, allowed to be to be, to be covered uh, by uh, social protection and some 217,000 uh, informal workers have joined the scheme since it was launched. We also have a scheme specifically for farm workers, uh, the campesinos, uh, Seguro Social Campesino, covering more than 1 million people today. And there's a scheme for uh, the carers, uh, mostly women, who within households, within communities, perform essential care work for which they are neither uh, remunerated nor most often recognized. There's a scheme called Cabajores uh, No Remunerados del Hogar that aims to cover also that segment of the working population. I think for all these reasons, Ecuador can uh, be very proud of what it has been achieving so far and um, we can look forward with optimism um, uh, towards the next step. However, I listed five major achievements. I now would like to highlight five major challenges that were discussed um, in my various meetings, either um, with the government uh, or other public officials or with communities I met across the country. The first um, important uh, challenge um, is the need to improve the quality of education. The coverage of education has um, been improving since it uh, reached a very low point in the years 2015-2016, but the quality of education still leaves much to be desired. We need to make the school curriculum more relevant, more attractive. We need to train teachers better into new pedagogical methods to make sure that children not only attend their schooling, but also learn and acquire the skills and qualifications they need uh, to be productive adults. That is, I think, the first challenge. Um, schools today do not really compensate for the disadvantage.
advantage that their children experience when they come from low income families. And we need to equip schools better so that they can compensate for the advantages rather than perpetuating the privilege. Uh, this is uh, something we discussed at some length with the Minister of Education, Maria Brown, who is very uh, much aware of the challenge. The second challenge is that Ecuador needs to do more to improve the provision of basic services in rural areas. It is very striking when we look at the figures of poverty and extreme poverty that there are huge, huge gaps between the urban and rural areas and that some provinces, particularly the province of Morona, Santiago, Pastaza, and Napo, are significantly more affected by income poverty than other parts of the country. And just to take one indicator of this gap, um, multi-dimensional poverty is 70.1% in um, rural areas. Multi-dimensional poverty is 23.2% in urban areas. So the gap between rural areas and urban areas is very significant in access to water and sanitation, to education, to healthcare, to employment. That is, I believe, the, the, the second major challenge um, the uh, government of Ecuador will be facing. The third challenge is that the social protection system that has increased its coverage of the population is still not very effective at reaching the poorest of the poor in the country. And the targeting of social protection remains weak. I believe much more should be done to strengthen the unit of the social registry because the um, exclusion of this involved in the way the social registry is designed today remain very significant. Um, many low income households are still not benefiting from social assistance or any form of social protection. And uh, that is largely because we have not yet um, approached social protection as a matter of right that people who qualify can claim by providing them with information about the conditions under which they can be supported by the state and with claims mechanisms they can use if they face instances of exclusion. So the targeting of social protection should be improved. Much more effort should go into the social registry being updated and, and um, reaching the poor. And uh, we should adopt a rights-based approach to social protection to improve this, this target. The fourth challenge is that the rights of workers uh, deserve to be better protected and better enforced across the country. This is a country of 80 million people. And yet, there are only 140 labor inspectors under the supervision of the Ministry of Labor and Employment, and 100 inspectors uh, that depend on the Ecuadorian Institute for Social Security. 240 inspectors in Boston. This is grossly insufficient to cover all the um, employers uh, and places of employment in the country. And it should come as no surprise if many informal workers are not adequately uh, protected by labor legislation, and if many fee cuts across the country entirely remain um, under the radar. Many of you will be aware of the um, emotion caused by slavery-like conditions in uh, plantations owned by uh, the company Fukurawa, but there are many other Fukurawas across the country. And I alerted the Vice Minister for Labour and Employment, Mr. Henry Valencia, to this. I alerted President Guillermo Lasso to this. I identified for them certain haciendas where monitoring is still insufficient and where labour inspectors uh, should uh, ensure that health and safety, uh, minimum wage, um, the provision of child labor are better enforced. And I welcome the personal commitment of Henry Valencia and President Lasso to addressing this, uh, this issue. Fifth and finally, um, there is, of course, a need in this country that is rightly proud of its diversity. 
to do more for the Afro descendants, the Afro colonial community, and to do more for the indigenous uh, groups, uh, some of whom I, I visited in the province of uh, Pastata and in uh, other parts of the country, including in particular in the province of Chibarat. Um, here, one, uh, one priority is certainly to better protect the rights to land and territory of indigenous groups. As we know, more than 10 years ago, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights identified certain gaps in the protection of land rights of indigenous communities in the famous case of the Quechua community of Sarayaku versus Ecuador. The judgment was delivered on 27th of June, 2012. And that judgment, more than 10 years later, still is not fully implemented. Particularly as regards the removal of these clauses that threaten the right to life of the Sahayaku on their territory, and with regard to the implementation of the right to free, prior, and informed consent, that is in Article 57, Paragraph 7 of the Constitution of Ecuador, but that is also a requirement under international, international human rights law, particularly under. The, two, uh, the 2007 uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was adopted by the General Assembly of the UN and under Convention Number 169 of the International Labour Organization um, on uh, Tribal and Indigenous Peoples. Um, those instruments um, impose an obligation to recognize that for any uh, projects, development projects developed in the territories of indigenous groups. Those groups should have a right to free prior and informed consent, and that is still not adequately uh, protected under Ecuadorian legislation. And of course, the other priority for indigenous groups is that their communities need to be better served by basic services, uh, access to water and sanitation access to education, including higher education, access to healthcare, and all uh, deserve to be strengthened for the benefit of these communities. And I am, of course, aware of the challenges, uh, particularly for remote communities. I'm aware of the increased costs this represents, but um, these communities have a right to be um, better served um, by the by service. Now, I identified five major achievements. I identified five major challenges. I am aware, of course, of the constraints that um, the state of Ecuador faces. And I think we have to acknowledge that there is a need to be much more imaginative in the search for solutions. I have spoken to uh, many communities and to um, many members of the government during my two weeks mission, and I identified three um, ways forward in order to improve and expand the fiscal space the state may use in order to finance a policy that will bridge the gap between the rural and urban areas and improve the provision of healthcare, education, um, uh, water and sanitation to the community. The first uh, uh, priority in this regard is uh, to make uh, taxation more progressive. In October 2021, a fiscal reform was adopted that made progress in this direction. Um, we could do more, and the progress achieved then have been um, encountering a, a setback since October 2001. We can do more in two ways. First, by ensuring that more of public revenue comes from direct taxation on income, particularly um, the higher um, incomes of uh, households and corporate incomes. Um, and less should come from indirect taxation, from VAT or from from consumer taxes that are invested. And with respect to direct taxation, um, the rate of taxation on high
higher income earners, he said, whether advanced large um, corporation discounts could be improved. So there is room to make the taxation system more progressive. There is also lots of room to do more to combat uh, tax evasion that represents a significant drain on the country's public revenue. So that is the first, um, I think, way by which we can better finance social protection, health, education, and the provision of water and sanitation. The second tool that is used are um, debts for nature swaps. Now, as you know, on 9th of May 2023, uh, President Lasso announced that um, a deal had been reached concerning the preservation of biodiversity in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, that is the most important uh, depth versus nature or depth for nature swap that had been implemented to date. It's more ambitious than what was done in the Seychelles Islands, in Belize, in Barbados. Um, that deal is not um, without its own uh, problems. Um, I share the concern that many groups have expressed concerning the lack of accountability, the lack of transparency, the use of tax havens uh, in the US state of Delaware, in Ireland, in order to um, uh, set up this uh, debt for nature swap. And I note with regret that the impact on the debt service of the country will only be felt in the years 2030, 2035, when actually it is in 2025, 2056 that the um, impact of the debt servicing obligation uh, of the country will be the most important. So in, in that sense, the Galapagos deal uh, will not provide relief to Ecuador um, at the most crucial time uh, in two or three years as, as it might have had. However, we can learn from past experiences and we can explore the possibility of future depth for nature swaps concerning particularly the Amazon corridor that was announced uh, just a couple of days ago by, by the government. And I look forward to continuing a dialogue with the government on how such a swap could be made much more sustainable and work for the benefit of the communities that depend on the Amazon forest. That's the second uh, tool I recommend exploring in order to create the system space the country needs to better finance public services and strengthen uh, the social protection of the population. The third uh, tool is to open uh, a debate on how to gradually um, and carefully re-examine uh, the system to which the use of fossil fuels are subsidized in the country. The current situation is not sustainable. Today, uh, about uh, $4.5 billion go to subsidizing the consumption of fossil fuels. That system of subsidies is not only very expensive, it is also regressive. It primarily benefits the 20% richest so the groups of the population. And it is not sustainable from the environmental point of view. It does not encourage sustainable modes of production and consumption as would be required under uh, SDG sustainable development goal number 12. And in fact, the SDGs include one specific target on fuel subsidies, referring to the fact that this is target. 12C, that these fuel subsidies should be phased out, I quote, in a manner that protects the poor and the affected community. I believe this is something that can be done. The budget that goes today to fossil fuel subsidies is equivalent to the whole budget of the Ministry of Education. It is almost four times the budget that goes to social assistance, despite the recent expansion of that budget. And so this is an enormous amount of money that goes to 
um, supporting what means I completely acknowledge this an important lifeline for many communities across the country, but is not sustainable in the long term. My hope is that the next administration can consider investing much more for rural communities, particularly for indigenous groups across the country, investing much more in access to education, access to healthcare, improved access to irrigation for agricultural producers, improved access to water and sanitation services for households, better school feeding programs. And those policies, in the interest of rural communities and indigenous communities, could be financed by gradually and carefully reducing the amount of subsidies going to uh, the consumption of fossil fuels. I have spoken uh, to Leonidas Ivan Salazar, the, the president of CONAIE, for a very productive meeting. I spoke also to Marlon Vargas, the head of CONAIE. I have great respect for the uh, leaders of indigenous uh, communities. And I am confident that uh, they know what is in the interest of their community. And they know that they need much more investment in healthcare, education, water and sanitation for the improvement of the living conditions of the communities. And, and this can be financed by such a gradual phasing out of fossil fuel projects. Um, so these are three directions in which I have recommended um, the government to explore the possibility of expanding the fiscal space to finance um, uh, policies against poverty. Let me close with a final reflection on what happened on 20th of August um, when the first round of the presidential elections took place and when a new National Assembly was uh, elected. On that day, Almost 59% of the voters across the country, 13 million of them, voted in favor of uh, keeping the oil in the soil of the Yasuni National Park. And with respect to the metallic mining in the Choco Angino, 68% um, of the voters consulted were of the view that metallic mining should not uh, develop further in the Choco Island. The message of it is very clear. We should move away from an extractivist approach uh, to development, and we should be much more imaginative in how we finance both world policies. It's an important message that the next administration cannot ignore. I believe this is good news. I think the real wealth of the country is not in its subsoil, it is in its people. I believe the priority today is not to dig deeper. It is to provide basic services. It is to protect nature. It is to invest in communities in order to provide real perspectives, real opportunities to the youth of this country. I would like to close with this. I would like to reiterate my thanks to the government of Ecuador for facilitating the mission. I would like to thank the United Nations country team in the country um, for its uh, fantastic support uh, to the mission. And I benefited a lot from their wise advice and their logistical support. And I would like to thank my team, um, Federica Donati from the Office of the Archbishop of Human Rights, Carlos lopez my senior advisor, and the other members of the team for their support. Uh, without them, this mission would not have been possible. Thank you very much indeed, and I look forward to your question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiller. Muchas gracias. Y en este momento, tengo que te rindo tiempo para las consultas de nuestros colegas de la Federación que nos acompañan acá y también de quienes han consignado sus inquietudes a través de la sala Zoom, a cuales yo les daré eh, lectura y seguida. Comiencen a ver lo que hace. Eh, por favor, pues, si, si tuvieran alguna inquietud, eh, puedan levantar una mano para poder consultar. 
Lo voy a hacer en español, no sé si tengo una buena traducción. En materia de derechos humanos, ¿cuál es su visión con respecto a la libertad de expresión en el país? Hay cinco periodistas ahora mismo que salieron por amenazas, ya sea del crimen organizado o del propio gobierno nacional. Thank you for this question. My mandate is on poverty and human rights, and it's uh, how the human rights of people in poverty can be better um, respected and protected. I therefore have not been able to look into the cases that you described, and the, the United Nations human rights system um, has other mechanisms that are better equipped than um, this special procedure to address this. So I'm sorry, I'm unable to comment further on this. Uh, but I, 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 I do think it is a very worrying trend that journalists are forced into exile as a result of the rising security defenses. Absolutely. For a share of this weapon. Eh, señor Richard, usted ha mencionado varios puntos por los cuales atraviesa la condición de pobreza en Ecuador, pero si usted tuviera que mencionar uno urgente en el que tiene que trabajar este gobierno con el tiempo que le queda hasta diciembre eh, de administración para poder enfrentar esos niveles de pobreza, ¿cuál debería ser el fundamental, el urgente? Urgent measures that can be adopted immediately are not necessarily the, the most impactful in the long term. But if your question is what can be done before um, um, November, uh, the one priority I could see um, would be to legislate on free, prior, and informed consent to implement Article 57, Paragraph 7 of the Constitution. And I think the debates concerning um, the executive decree. 754 that was suspended by the Constitutional Court on 23rd of July because of the confusion between environmental consultation and free prior and informed consent under respectively Article 398 of the Constitution and Article 57, Paragraph 7 of the Constitution. That controversy shows the need to legislate on the matter and better protect that right that is so important for indigenous groups. And, now, and, and, and let me let me add to this that in addition to speaking with indigenous communities, I had many conversations with many civil society groups that, um, whether or not from indigenous origin, um, have been impacted by mining projects, legal or illegal, across the country, and have seen the soils polluted, the water sources polluted, making it more difficult sometimes for campesinos to have access to irrigation for their fields. And so I think that um, better protecting the environment, uh, legislating to protect the rights of nature is, is equally important. So are you saying are you saying that you have actually find out a stricter correlation between uh, mining projects uh, and uh, poverty in some affected community? And if so, which kind of correlation? Thanks. The, the, the number of testimonies I received concerning mining projects that affected livelihoods is um, too important for me to list all the examples that have been presented. Um, although internationally it's the Mirador mega mining project that have been most widely discussed, there are many other such projects I was able to receive information about. And indeed, it is not unusual that concessions are granted um, without proper consultation and involvement, participation of the local communities who discover that they've been fenced off on resources, from resources on which they depend, uh, particularly um, access to land, but even access to water uh, sources, making it more difficult for them to irrigate their land, and resulting in 
their the resources on which they depend being polluted, um, which is detrimental to uh, local food security in, in, some, in some cases. This is one of the reasons why rural communities across the country are being emptied out of their youth. Many young adults are now migrating either to the United States or to Sydney. And uh, that should be alarming uh, to the government. Um, and, and yes, protecting resources on which these communities depend is the first step towards um, slowing down this very worrying trend. And there are some examples of these projects, these mining projects, in the end of mission statement that will be distributed to the community. No sé si tenemos alguna otra inquietud acá en la sala. Nos han informado que eh, de momento no hay inquietudes en esta razón. Perfecto, muchas gracias. Buenos días. Usted mencionó que se había reunido con el señor Epista para analizar el tema de los residuos combustibles. Quería saber eh, cuál es la visión que tiene el señor Isaac después de su diálogo debido a que precisamente este fue uno de los temas que provocaron las manifestaciones en años pasados. Of course, I, I am aware, of course, of the very high sensitivity of the issue. My dialogue with Leonid, Leonidas Isa was extremely constructive, um, and and uh, I have great respect for their their struggles for their rights um, and 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 i completely understand the mistrust the suspicion um, that um, is the inheritance from the past political history particularly from the way um, subsidies to fuel uh, to fossil fuel use were threatened to be removed under lenin moreno's um, um, administration in october 2019 I believe, um, although I'm not here to express the views of uh, Leonidas Isa in any way, I believe that he is a, a, a man of dialogue and understands perfectly that the interest of the indigenous communities um, is to receive better services from the state. And that um, the enormous amounts of public revenue that go to financing these subsidies could be put to a much better use for indigenous communities. Um, so I'm hopeful that the dialogue can be um, relaunched with the next administration, perhaps. I'm hopeful that trust can be created um, and that if the transition is made in a way that is gradual, properly sequenced with services being provided first and the gradual um, uh, reduction of subsidies coming after, I think there is room for dialogue there. Tenemos una consulta que llega desde la sala Zoom. Dice, buenas tardes, ¿hay algunas recomendaciones? Pregunta eh, si hay algunas recomendaciones sobre derechos humanos de las mujeres frente al alto nivel de embarazo infantil y adolescente y la violencia sexual en el país en su relación con la pobreza. So, thank you for this question. This is, of course, extremely um, important since all the indicators of poverty show that women are more affected than men. And the uh, levels of poverty that we have in some uh, provinces of the country in particular, um, especially in rural areas, uh, is one major or are one major uh, factor explaining uh, gender-based violence. Um, and the statistics on gender-based violence, which we find in end of mission statements, uh, show the, the importance of the problem. Um, we did discuss this issue at, at length with uh, different uh, parts of the administration. And um, um, clearly, there is a need um, to ensure that social protection reaches women first. Um, we know that um, the, the money supporting the household, whether under social assistance or under social protection schemes, is better spent when women are in charge of making the decisions. 
um, I am reassured and encouraged by the fact that in many cases, um, the bonus supports female headed households, ensuring that the use made of the money of the support given to the household will be spent in the interest of the child. Um, but I, I completely acknowledge that much more should be done to, to tackle gender based violence. Um, the fight against poverty um, is, is also a fight for gender equality in that sense. And I would refer the, the, um, the person asking the question, I would refer that person back to the admission statement that contains more detailed comments and support. For cierto, el, el statement de final de emisión se encuentra disponible en versión impresa. En el, en el exterior de esta sala lo pueden encontrar en versión en impresa, en, en español. Y en las versiones en inglés y en español están también colgadas en el sitio web. Una pregunta más que llega desde la sala Zoom. Pregunta, entre poblaciones empobrecidas urbanas y rurales, las más empobrecidas somos las mujeres. ¿Hay alguna recomendación al respecto? Well, um, this, this question in part um, replicates the previous one. Um, I, I met quite a few associations of, of, of women um, who explained the, the kind of support they, they, they needed. I think one major factor that deserves to be highlighted is that in the absence of adequate childcare services and in the absence of uh, uh, more efforts to ensure free school education for children, the employment opportunities for women uh, will remain um, less uh, real than, than for men, and the economic empowerment of women uh, will be uh, will be delayed and and um, uh, less less real. So, investing in childcare services, investing in preschool um, education, um, ensuring also that micro credit um, schemes are made available for women and some programs exist in this regard are all ways to ensure a greater economic independence for women and um, uh, thus uh, uh, allow them to be uh, better protected from both poverty and um, gender based violence within our yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Shover. And if I'm not going to have any questions, I'm going to have a lot of questions. Muchas gracias. Después de su visita, usted, eh, usted entregará este informe al gobierno nacional, al gobierno de Guillermo Lazo. ¿Ha tenido un acercamiento con alguno de los candidatos también, eh, considerando que Ecuador eh, está en el marco de un proceso electoral y que celebrará un balotaje el próximo 15 de octubre? ¿Cuál es, ¿Nos puede explicar cuál es el mecanismo después de las visitas y el informe que se ha levantado? Thank you. I did request uh, to meet with uh, Luisa Gonzalez and uh, Daniel Loboa, the two finalists. Um, I could not meet with them. The agenda uh, was not uh, compatible, unfortunately. And um, it is indeed um, a, a rather unusual situation in which my first interlocutor is the present administration, but my interlocutor starting in uh, end of November will be, will be the, the new administration. Um, either led by Luisa Gonzalez or by Daniel Noboa. Um, however, there is a, a continuity in the services uh, provided by the state, and many high level public servants will remain in place. Many multi year strategies uh, guiding the efforts of the government will remain in place, and first and foremost, um, the challenges will remain the same. Um, what I hope is that there will be a constructive engagement of the next administration with um, my mandate, uh, that there will be a, a, a good response uh, on the draft report that will be presenting uh, to the next administration that they will then react to before the report presented to the international community becomes final. And I, I I have a personal appeal to make to Daniel Neboa and Luisa Gonzalez uh, that they commit before the 15th of October to studying the recommendations and addressing those recommendations with the, which they believe fits um, or fits within their uh, vision for the country. 
I would challenge them to provide a response before election day uh, to the recommendations that are mentioned in the end of mission statement I'm presenting today. Muchas gracias, Juan Inquietud Más, eh, desde quienes atienden esta conferencia de prensa de manera virtual sobre el tema de la delincuencia en Esmeraldas que afecta a los defensores de la naturaleza, donde por pretexto de este combate de la delincuencia están siendo desplazados de sus tierras. ¿Hay alguna recomendación puntual? Well, I, I met with uh, quite a few people from the province of Esmeralda, so although not, uh, not in Esmeralda itself, they very generously traveled uh, Choco de Valle um, in order to meet with me, so I had very good conversation. And yes, it is a very um, worrying uh, trend we see in um, Esmeralda. Um, the rise in insecurity is largely the result of the young uh, population in Esmeraldas uh, having little economic opportunity. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many adolescents uh, left the school and were not able to continue to be enrolled in part because it's very difficult to follow um, uh, classes taught online uh, when you are in a in a low income context with the weak or no access to the internet. And many have not returned to school since and have become easy prey uh, for the gangs, um, um, for, the, for the criminal gangs that are um, increasingly um, influential in this, in this country since um, um, the years 2016, 2017. Uh, so it's a real challenge that we face. The answer is not simply to put more armed forces in the streets, as I mentioned, the answer is to provide this, uh, these youth with opportunities, and that includes uh, better protecting access to, to resources, including land and water, um, for those rural communities affected by, um, by the, um, uh, the projects uh, affecting their land. Thank you very much. Eh, si no hay más preguntas de la sala, entonces, queremos agradecerles infinitamente su presencia y, por supuesto, reiterar que el Land Information Statement se encuentra impreso en la parte exterior de esta sala, igual accesible a través del de sitio del Alto Comisionado de las Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos para su descarga ya disponible en la Muchas gracias a todos y todas. Thank you. Thank you very much.